Hello, this is Little Green Ghouls, and welcome back to Goosebumps Revisited, a series where I break down a classic Goosebumps book and any episode that goes along with it. I will also be telling us for Goosebumps cliches and classic moments. This week, I'm excited to visit How to Kill a Monster. This is one I for sure read as a kid and remembered loving because it had lots of monster action, and I can see why, since this book was just as much fun as I remembered it being. This story probably contains our worst Goosebumps adults to date, but I can forgive it for giving us a solid 60 pages of monster chaos. If you haven't read this one yet, you should. We have another solid cover this week, with the star of our book creeping around the door. I've always loved the color combinations we have going on, the blues, pinks, and greens. I just think it's an effectively creepy cover that makes you want to read more. The 2003 slime border is kind of ugly to me. It essentially washes out the picture by making it all kind of the same ugly salmon color. I just don't think it looks nearly as good as the original. There was again no later 2000s cover, and no merchandise this week, aside from the trading card book tear-out that you find with some copies of the book. I don't usually look at the Goosebumps clothing, because it's kind of hard to discern if it's modern or original 90s, but I did think it was funny that they would leave out the word kill out of the title on this shirt because it's just too much for children's clothing, I guess. The back of the book makes up for the lack of merchandise though, because there's quite a bit this week. We have this page promoting various Goosebumps games and puzzles that I haven't seen yet, and it includes the Terror in the Graveyard game, four different spooky puzzles, the Goosebumps Shrieks and Spiders game that I actually used to own but never understood how to play, and a Goosebumps storytelling card game that also seems vaguely familiar to me. On the next page, we have a promo for the Goosebumps book and Halloween costume accessories pack, which apparently had 10 Halloween stories and came with some toys like fake vampire blood, plastic fangs, fake skin, and more. Then on the last page, we have a promo for the Goosebumps VHS tapes, which were $14.98 each. This one is promoting the haunted mask, and each VHS came with its own bookmark, because at this point, Goosebumps had their merchandise down to a science. Our front tag says, step one, run. Step two, run faster. And I kind of love this tag just because it's a little bit different than what we usually see. Our back tag says, home alone, with a monster, which doesn't make these kids home alone after all now, does it? But let's get to the blurb on the back. Gretchen and her stepbrother Clark hate staying at their grandparents' house. Grandpa Eddie is totally deaf, and Grandma Rose is obsessed with baking. Plus, they live right in the middle of a dark, muddy swamp. Things could get any worse, right? Wrong because there's something really weird about Grandma and Grandpa's house. Something odd about that room upstairs. The one that's locked. The one with the strange noises coming from it. Strange, growling noises. Okay, let's start the summary. The book opens with our introduction to Gretchen, and she's on her way to Mudtown in Georgia. She's not thrilled though, because her parents are leaving her and her stepbrother Clark with their grandparents, while the parents go on a business trip to Atlanta. Gretchen is very distraught at the idea of staying in a swamp, but I visited swamps and I think they're spooky awesome. I wouldn't want to live in one though. Gretchen's grandparents Eddie and Rose are mysterious creatures who never leave the swamp and neither kids have seen them in 8 years. The only thing Clark remembers about the grandparents is that they stink like mildew and mothballs. The family golden retriever Charlie is also joining the kids on this little swamp adventure, but right now the kids are getting stir crazy in the back seat and starting to fight. Clark is super into scary comic books and Gretchen's current hobby seems to be bothering Clark. His current comic is Creatures from the Muck, so he's on theme. And we learn this comic is all about alligator-human hybrids that live in the mud and trap people and keep them as slaves. They also snatch children from their beds at night and drown them in the swamp, so Clark is getting himself nice and freaked out for his stay at his grandparents. The car traverses a rickety old wooden bridge, and just when they think they're safely across, an explosion rocks the car and sends the car plummeting towards the swamp in a chapter cliffhanger. This was all just the result of a flat tire, and Gretchen is relieved that the fall was essentially just into the ditch. The family empties from the car so the dad can put on a spare tire. It's sunset, and Gretchen thinks they can get a little exploring in before it's completely dark out. Clark is rightfully hesitant about this plan, but agrees because he doesn't want to look like a frady cat. Right away, the kids are swarmed with mosquitoes, and Clark is already to head back to the car. They walk past cypress trees draped in Spanish moss, and are getting the proper swamp experience. The deeper they venture into the swamp, the darker it gets, and Clark's white high tops are getting destroyed by the muck. The swamp is getting noisy, and Gretchen wonders what kind of creatures are lurking out here with them. She suddenly hears heavy footsteps coming towards them with ragged breathing. She tries to escape, but it's too late as a dark figure with red glowing eyes approaches from the darkness in another chapter cliffhanger. This just ends up being Charlie, and he should be offended after being described as some sort of hideous swamp monster. Charlie knocks Gretchen into the mud, and their mom appears, and she is pissed, because they fixed the flat tire and have been searching everywhere for these kids in this dark, nasty swamp. Everybody has to help push the car back on the road, and they are thoroughly covered in swamp muck, so it's not a pleasant ride home from here on out. They reach the grandparents' house, and the kids are shocked it's not some sort of swamp shack, but a swamp castle instead. It's three stories tall, made of dark stone, with a window on each floor, and even a turret on the right side of the house. We meet the grandparents, and they smell just as bad as Clark remembered. Grandpa Eddie is also hard of hearing, so this leads to multiple misunderstandings right off the bat. The inside of the castle is kinda drab and old, and Clark comments that it smells even worse than their grandparents. They enter the kitchen for some chicken pot pies, when Charlie starts sniffing around and losing his mind, he barks and snarls until the kids get him back out of the kitchen where he can calm down. 
This confuses the whole family because he's never acted like this before. After dinner, the kids get some terrible news. There's no phone or television, and their grandparents' car is currently broken down, so they'll be trapped in the swamp with nothing to do. At bedtime, Gretchen gets to check out her room, which is enormous like the rest of the house, except it's essentially empty with just a creaky old bed and a lopsided dresser. There's also no window in this room, so it's not up to fire code. As Gretchen tries to fall asleep on this musty old bed, she suddenly hears frightening animal howls on the other side of the wall. She sits up very alert and finally concludes that the animal noises are actually coming from the swamp before finally falling to sleep. The next morning she wakes up to explore the empty house. Every room is large but sparsely decorated with old rotting furniture. She glances out the window and admires an exotic purple bird, but is startled when she hears an animal howl from the swamp again. She decides to wake Clark, but when she busts into his room she's horrified to find just a pile of clothes on the floor, and the room a mess like there's been some sort of struggle. This is just Gretchen's imagination running wild though, and Clark emerges from the closet still getting dressed, so she needs to learn some manners and knock. They head downstairs and find their grandma making blueberry pancakes, except both grandma and her kitchen are filthy. Stein's doing a nice job of making this house just feel nasty. I can't stand dirty places. The kids sit down to a mountain of pancakes, and Gretchen wonders why the hell grandma made more than humanly possible to eat, especially since grandma herself isn't having any. Gretchen then remembers she has presents for her grandparents in her suitcase and races back to her room. While heading down the dark hallway, she suddenly notices something looming towards her, and after some unnecessary drama, we find out it's just Grandpa Eddie. It's almost like he lives here or something. Gretchen needs to calm down because we can't hit every chapter cliffhanger, just be her imagination running wild. She realizes Grandpa Eddie is carrying a huge platter of pancakes down the hall, but before she can spy any further, Charlie appears and ruins the steak out by barking and growling like the night before. We jump to after breakfast, and the kids are outside exploring the swamp because there's no TV to watch, and that's better than being inside a dark creepy ass house. Clark is worried about snakes and gators, which delights Gretchen because we've established that she just likes to rile this boy up. Grandpa Eddie appears and warns them not to go too far, and Clark suddenly trips over a mysterious figure in the grass. This is supposed to be a chapter cliffhanger, but it ends up just being a cypher's root. They head back inside to help Grandma Rose make three rhubarb pies, and again Gretchen wonders why on earth her grandma makes so much damn food. My grandma had ten kids, so grandma's making insane portions is normal to me. Grandma Rose then suggests the kids explore the house and look for old treasures, but Grandpa Eddie warns them to stay out of the locked room at the end of the third floor because it's dangerous. He claims it's a supply closet full of fragile valuables, but we all know better than that. While exploring the house, so far all the kids have found are boxes of old newspapers and a small library full of dusty books. Gretchen finds a box full of magazines at one point and is excited at first. That is until she realizes the box is also full of cockroaches and starts screaming as they scatter across her hands. The cockroaches are fast moving little things and manage to crawl up her arms and end up on her face and in her clothes. Clark tries his best to help, but ends up just hitting Gretchen with a rolled up magazine. Once free of the cockroaches, Gretchen is itchy but still wants to explore more of this house. The next room ends up being not so bad because it's full of old games and toys. You'd think the grandparents would have just sent the kids there directly versus being like, root through all of our old shit. This excitement for the toy room is also short lived though because on closer inspection, every single toy seems to be damaged in some way and it's creeping the kids out. They leave the room, but when Gretchen turns off the light, Clark is suddenly nowhere to be found. This results in him just popping out a page later shouting boo, because Stein has run out of things for these kids to do in this boring old house. Clark suggests they play hide and seek, which Gretchen is not into, but it's too late, he's already running off to hide. This results in Gretchen finally getting to explore the mysterious third floor with the forbidden room. This house is a death trap though, because in addition to being full of the hantavirus, at one point Gretchen nearly falls through an abandoned stairway onto the next floor below. She backs away from the death trap stairs and comes across the forbidden room. She's tempted to explore it because of a silver key right in the lock waiting to be turned, but she has more self control than I would and decides to respect her grandparents' rules. Gretchen is over being it for hide and seek, so she decides just to hide herself until Clark gets bored enough to come search for her. She comes across an old dumbwaiter and thinks this is the perfect hiding place. If she had read The Headless Ghost, she would know this is a terrible idea. Just before she can crawl in it though, she hears a crash in the forbidden room. She thinks, of course, that's where Clark would hide because he knew she wouldn't look there, so she races over to open the door. She yanks it open and is suddenly face to face with the monster in a chapter cliffhanger. I nearly fell into the room. I couldn't move, couldn't back away, couldn't take my eyes off him. A living breathing monster, at least 10 feet tall, standing inside the locked room. I gaped at his big furry body, a body like a gorilla, with leaves, tree roots, and sand tangled in his fur. His head was scaly, with snapping rows of jagged alligator teeth. A foul stench filled the room, the putrid smell of decay, the smell of the swamp. My stomach heaved. The creature raised his eyes to me, bulging eyes on the sides of his enormous head. He held me in his stare for a moment. Then he glanced down at his hairy paws, where he was balancing a tall stack of pancakes. He began stuffing the pancakes into his mouth, devouring them, gnashing them with his jagged teeth. With one hand, the monster shoved pancakes into his mouth, stacks at a time. With the other, he scratched at his big furry legs. Scratched and scratched, until he found a big black beetle nesting in his fur. He held up the beetle to the side of his head, to one of his bulging eyes. The beetle's legs waved in the air. 
He glared at the beetle, at the waving legs, then he popped the bug into his mouth and chomped down on the shiny black shell with a sickening crunch. Blueberries and beetle juice oozed from his mouth. Gretchen spends an awful long time just standing there staring at the monster before finally deciding to run away, except her dumbass doesn't lock the door behind her. Clark appears to see what all the screaming is about, and he doesn't run away when Gretchen tells him to. Instead, he walks into the room to see the monster for himself, and quickly comes racing down the hall when he sees that the monster really is there. The kids race down the stairs and then have to stop Charlie from racing up to fight the monster. As the kids are struggling to control Charlie, they can hear the monster thundering down the hallway towards the staircase. The kids get Charlie in a bathroom on the second floor and lock him in for his own safety. Gretchen searches the house for the grandparents, but they're nowhere to be found. Meanwhile, they can hear the monster lumbering around room to room above them. They decide to check outside, but realize the grandparents have locked them in just as they spot the car driving towards town. So these kids are now locked in a castle with a monster on the loose. This is one of the better books so far, because Stein is not waiting to the last few pages to get the ball rolling. We still have over half a book of monster mischief to go at this point. The kids check all the doors and windows and confirm they really are locked in. Meanwhile, they hear the monster throwing an old piano across the room above them. The monster's destruction is causing the entire house to shake, so vases are falling over and shattering to the ground, and even an entire bookshelf topples over. Gretchen is getting ready to burst out a window when she hears Charlie's whimpering upstairs and decides they need to rescue him first. And I don't blame them, I'd want to rescue Charlie too. They sneak up to the second floor and are able to get Charlie out of the bathroom without too much issue, other than Charlie doesn't understand the meaning of the word sneak and keeps barking loudly. The kids then hear a car in the driveway and race downstairs, but it's too late, the car has already left. This was apparently the general store manager who stuck a phone message under the door stating that the parents won't be back until next week because the business trip is taking longer than expected. Gretchen then hears Clark screams for help in the kitchen and she races to him, but manages to trip and smack her head on the ground pretty good, so now she's slightly delirious. She reaches the kitchen and finds Clark with probably one of the most insane letters in Goosebumps history. Dear Gretchen and Clark, We're sorry to do this to you, but we had to leave. A few weeks ago, a swamp monster invaded our house. We captured it in the room upstairs. Then, we didn't know what to do with it. We didn't have a car, so we couldn't get to a phone to call for help. We've lived in terror for the past few weeks. We were afraid to let the monster out. It's so loud and angry all the time. We know it would have killed us. We didn't want to tell your parents about the creature. If they did, they wouldn't have let you come. We don't get many visitors here. We wanted to so much to see you, but I guess we were wrong. You should have gone to Atlanta with your mother and father. I guess we were wrong to let you stay. We have been feeding the creature, slipping food through an opening grandpa sawed in the bottom of the door. The monster eats a lot, but we have to feed him. We're afraid not to. We know it's unfair to run off now, but we're just going for help. We'll be back as soon as we can find someone. Someone who knows what to do with this horrible beast. Sorry kids, we really are, but we had to bolt you inside the house to make sure you didn't wander off into the swamp by yourselves. It's not safe out there. But just remember one thing, you are perfectly safe as long as... Clark drops the letter before they can read the final sentence, so the kids spend a few pages trying to get the letter out from under the fridge. When they finally do, it just says, you'll be safe as long as you don't let the monster out. These grandparents have to be the worst adults we've encountered so far. They've locked their grandchildren in the house with the monster and left without saying goodbye. Surely Stein could have thought of a better way to seal the kids in the house alone with the monster, but I guess it's easier just to make the grandparents fucking insane. At the bottom of the note, it says if the monster does get out, they'll just have to kill it. Clark tries to open the second letter for further instructions, but is unable to before the monster makes it to the first floor. The kids take off running back up the stairs and then argue back and forth about what they need to do. Clark says they should just hide until the grandparents return, but Gretchen thinks they'll need to kill the monster. The kids leave Charlie locked in the bathroom again because they think it's the safest option. The alligator monster spots them at the top of the stairs and runs back after him. This forces the kids to the third floor where Gretchen has an idea. She thinks they can trick the monster to walking off the collapsed staircase from earlier if they just lean against the wall and let the monster follow them in. The monster bursts into the stairwell and tips off the edge just like Gretchen had planned and then plummets to the ground. It's dark so they can't see if the monster is dead, but they don't hear anything so they consider the plan a success. The kids race downstairs to let Charlie out in celebration. It's only page 89 so it's clearly too soon to celebrate. The kids and the dog make their way to the library window so they can smash it and crawl out. But Gretchen decides the best way to do this is to use the candle holder she left in the second floor bathroom. As she's gathering her supplies, she hears growling coming from nearby and realizes the monster isn't dead after all. She gathers up Clark in the kitchen and they lock Charlie in a nearby room. Gretchen has a new plan and is to poison one of the rhubarb pies and leave it out for the monster to eat. The only issue is they just need to find something to poison the pie with, but Gretchen is pretty resourceful here. She gathers up some turpentine, drain cleaner, paint, mothballs, and rat poison and dumps it all into the pie. The kids then hide under the table as the monster enters the room searching for a snack. The monster ends up tearing off the oven door and eating the two other rhubarb pies before coming across the third one and swallowing it whole. The kids are then disappointed as the monster appears to enjoy the poisoned pie. She probably should have added more drain cleaner, clearly. Gretchen just wasn't being patient enough though, because soon the monster doesn't seem to feel well. The monster let out a long groan. I peered out from under the table. I saw the creature's eyes bug out. They practically popped out of his head. 
A gurgling, choking sound escaped his throat. He grasped at his neck with his two hairy paws. He groaned again. His stomach rumbled, a deep rumble. He clutched his stomach and doubled over. He uttered a weak cry of pain and surprise. Then he dropped dead on the kitchen floor. The kids are certain the monster is dead this time because Clark throws a comic book at its head and it doesn't move. These kids need to learn the importance of the double tap because there's still more book to go. They explore the room they locked Charlie in and discover a door with a window big enough for them to crawl out of if they break it. Just as Gretchen is grabbing a shovel to smash the window, they hear the monster roar to life in the next room over. The monster blocks the doorway and Gretchen tries and fails to fight the monster off with a shovel. She smacks it in the stomach and in response the monster snatches the shovel and snaps it in half like a toothpick. Gretchen then remembers the other letter and tries to get Clark to open it quickly. But as he's doing that, the monster snatches Gretchen by the arm and yanks her towards him. The monster lifts her up to its mouth, where Gretchen can admire how full of bugs and just how bad this monster smells like dirty swamp water. Charlie bites the monster on the leg, which distracts the monster briefly, and Clark tries and fails to fight the monster off too. The monster licks Gretchen and then raises her to its mouth. Then Stein probably should have quit while he was ahead. The monster suddenly starts speaking English and asks if Gretchen is a human. She says yes, and the monster responds it's allergic to humans, and then begins grasping at its throat as it starts to go into anaphylactic shock. The monster tips over and knocks down the door to the outside, where it supposedly collapses dead for the third time. They take off down the trail into the swamp with Charlie, and Gretchen is surprised to see that it's now night because they've been fighting this monster all afternoon. After racing through the swamp, Gretchen remembers the second letter. They open it up, only to discover it warns them to stay off the swamp trail and to stick with the road instead because, in a final page twist, we learn the swamp is full of the monster's brothers and sisters, and they're out for revenge. The two kids then just stand there in the middle of the swamp as they hear the familiar whistles of the monsters all around them, and wonder if either one has any more ideas. And that's how this one ends. A fairly silly end to the monster, but an overall solid book. How to Kill a Monster got a direct episode pairing, and like the book, I remember it being one of my favorites, so we'll see again if it holds up. Our notable actor this week is Ricky Mabe, who played Clark, because he's been steadily working and even appeared in shows like Preacher on AMC, but I like that he was the voice of Tommy Tibble of the notorious Tibble Twins on Arthur. So let's start this episode. We're in a proper swamp for this one. This does not seem like proper swamp attire. Kind of old, you know. My dad says sometimes they forget things. Yeah, like us. This child needs educated. Rose, that's what gumbo. It's grandma's specialty. I mean, I'd live there too. Grandma's house. Nice place. That would have to be some frog. What was that? How is he just a frog? Modern art. You know what? It's like a monster autopsy. Gumbo sounds really good right now. Actually, maybe not her gumbo. That's because it ain't chicken. It's gator. <laughs> Nothing to see here, kids. That was uh, swamp gas. This was more effort than Clark's scare in the book. <laughs> Seeing this makes it a little more understandable than what was described in the book. <sighs> they don't even bother locking the door in this version. The monster must not have thumbs. It kind of looks like the turkey from Thanks Killing. I like that the grandma is in her little sidecar cruising the swamp. What are they doing? Oh, I forgot about it. Again? Now the monster is reminding me of a dinosaur in addition to a killer turkey. I'm impressed they included this part. Is it dead? Wow. He's back and ready for gumbo. The poor thing doesn't like spice. Let's try this 
cellar. A coal chute escape is a good addition to the story. What is it? A coal chute! That's how they used to heat these old houses! He's back! Clark! I like that Clark just punches it in the mouth. Oh, here comes the allergy. The slime is a nice touch, too. I would have made the time to change clothes. Allergies! Clark the monster was allergic to- I'm just impressed how closely they followed the book on this one. So, got any more ideas? Overall, I really liked How to Kill a Monster. I think the swamp is a great location for a scary story, and it's been a while since we got to visit one. I also thought it was a nice change of pace to get a solid look at the monster, and then to have that monster torment the kids repeatedly for half of the book. The grandparents locking the kids in the house and the monster allergy are beyond stupid, but I can forgive that since it allows for multiple chase scenes and attempts at killing the monster. It was just nice coming across a Goosebumps book I liked as a kid that actually held up. I'm gonna give this one 5 out of 5 poisoned pies. I particularly enjoyed how much these kids hated the way their grandparents smelled. I thought it was funny. Okay, on to our totals. How to Kill a Monster didn't have any vomit, shoulder scares, asshole victims, it was only dreams, or 90s moments, but it did have a prank. Our solitary prank this week was when Clark pops out and startles Gretchen as they're searching the house. It's a bit low effort, but a prank nonetheless. This raises our total to 111 pranks. How to Kill a Monster had a solid amount of chapter cliffhangers, with a total of 12. This raises our Goosebumps total to 564. Our clunky cliffhanger this week has to be chapter 7 to 8, where Gretchen is somehow immediately terrified that someone is in the hallway, when it clearly has to be her Grandpa Eddie. Shocker ending. Our big twist for this book was a little ham-fisted, but once Gretchen and Clark make their escape into the swamp, they open the second letter and warn that the swamp is full of monsters. This brings our Goosebumps series total to 39. Well, that's it for How to Kill a Monster. Once again, we have another book I really liked. It's nice to see Stein isn't completely out of ideas this late in the series, although I really didn't like the monster's sudden allergy. It just felt too silly for a book that veered more towards the scary side. Next week we have Legend of the Lost Legend, and similar to The Beast from the East, I just kind of remember being confused by it as a kid and not really enjoying it. Let me know in the comments what you thought of How to Kill a Monster. Did the monster allergy ruin it for you? How else could have Stein sealed those kids in that house? How would you kill the monster? Also, what did you think of my swamp horror clips this week? I kind of expected that there'd be a lot more swamp horror out there, but it was slim pickings unless you want to focus on alligators. Anyways, as always, thanks again for watching, and make sure you subscribe for... The Brad. The Love.